So why is it called the Tartan Turban Secret Readings? Well, uh, it's called the Tartan Turban Secret Readings very simply because our company logo is a tartan turban and the turban is meant to represent me even though I have never worn a turban but of the two founding partners uh, my other founding partner Mike Welsh is Anglo-Scots and the tartan is his family tartan and the turban was meant to represent me and my ethnicity uh, as a South Asian uh, so it it made sense to when we launched the series for it to be called the tartan turban uh, reading series. Why secret? Because it actually the space is a bit of a secret. Not everyone knows it. The East End doesn't see a lot of literary activity, not as much as the West End and downtown Toronto. So all of those things make it a, a secret. And our, our outdoor space is even more of a secret because it's quite spectacular uh, and nobody knows it exists at all. Uh, so our readings become very special when we can bring all those things together. We started the Tartan Durban Secret Reading Series because, uh, uh, you know, it was Canada's 150th year and uh, we, we, uh, we wanted to do something that actually marked the 150th anniversary of Canada but that was in the multicultural sphere. Uh, and why the multicultural sphere? Because we are a multicultural agency. Uh, we focus on inclusion communications, on diversity communications. Uh, we do everything from, you know, uh, various ethnicities that are, you know, underserved and try to bring them into the into the picture. Uh, we we talk to people with disabilities. So inclusion is a big focus of ours. Uh, and on the 150th anniversary, it seemed like the perfect time to do something about uh, about multicultural talent in the in the written art sphere because that's my personal passion so it was my personal passion coming together with Canada's 150th coming together with the agency uh, that I'm a partner in uh, and the specialization that we have uh, and it all sort of uh, you know joined with then a wonderful group of people that I happen to be connected to starting with my uncle who, who uh, you know was the first person I thought of because I thought I, this sounds like a wonderful idea and I've been thinking of doing something in our office space after hours because it's a lovely space and it's empty after work and can we do something and I've been thinking about this for years but this really seemed to be a coming together a coming together time and I thought I can't do this on my own this is not something I can manage and I my uncle was actually the first person I thought of uh, and he was immediately accepting of the idea and willing to take it on as a challenge so uh, the next thing I knew we had a series running we got our first on first one on the go right away in May and we're gonna go till next May I wish I knew how many people have been invited actually uh, I would guess that we've had this is our fifth session we've had at least I think we'd say we uh, we, we, we've had an average of six featured writers per session, so at least 30 featured uh, writers, which means published authors with some reputation and some credibility, which is part of the intention. And they are combined with open mic readers, usually on an average of five per session, so that's another 30. Uh, and the idea is that emerging talent gets a voice, uh, emerging multicultural talent especially gets a voice uh, in the same, uh, on the same plat platform as established authors. Uh, so both are speaking and sharing their words and work and everyone, uh, I think everyone benefits from that, everyone rises because of it. We've had South Asian of every kind, uh, so Tamil, Indian, Pakistani, uh, Bangladeshi, we've had African, uh, Ethiopian, Eritrean, uh, we've had uh, Irish, we've had Greek, we've had, uh, uh, let me think, I'm, I'm, I'm Japanese I believe, Chinese, uh, <laughs> uh, we've had uh, Hispanic, uh, members of the Hispanic community reading in Spanish, uh, the Chinese community of course, uh, so yes, we've had writers from pretty much every ethnicity, uh, visible minorities and not non-visible minorities both. And um, yeah, that's that's been the one of the coolest things. We began the series in May this year, and the idea was to celebrate Canada's 150th year. 
with doing something which is inherently Canadian and that is multiculturalism. So the idea germinated with Gavin Barrett, who is the co-curator of the series. Uh, the idea was to celebrate multiculturalism and to invite writers to read their creations and have a good time. So when we began, we had planned it only for summer, which is why there is a summer in the series. But the response we got was incredible. And then we decided that we will continue it for at least one year. And so it has now become, the secret is no more a secret and the summer is gone. So we are now the Tartan Turban reading series. You will see from all the readings today that it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. So I've got two poems I'll share tonight. And I thought this was very timely because Art Toronto and International Art Fair starts tonight at the uh, Convention Centre. So this first poem is called North American Interactive Art. Masticate a stick, chewing gum. Extract and swallow flavored juices. Roll up the residue, use your tongue. Expel it forcefully onto new cast sidewalk or recently cleaned surfaces. Be quick about it. Return a few days later. Examine the effect of time. Visualize hundreds of shoes, dozens of dog paws, a skateboard wheel, some inline skates. Your chew now transformed a smooth, dark melanoma, a large cold sore a disfiguring birthmark on the concrete skin. Enjoy your co-creation. Tomorrow it may be gone. Sidewalk replaced by a gangrenous graft, pitch black asphalt. Um, so this next poem, I've struggled with the title and I'm gonna go back to my sort of my original title, and I'll call this one The Museum. A moment ago, our voices exuberant, older cousins planning adventures in the big city. We'll visit Ontario Place and the museum, the Royal Ontario Museum, a regal name befitting the treasures therein. Dinosaurs, Egyptian mummies, a knight's armor, but first, we attend to another matter, the purpose of our visit to Toronto. A sook, dad's cousin, leads the way. Solemn silence as we descend the stairs, vision momentarily lost as our eyes adjust to the dim light, the dampness clawing at us as it seeps through the rough stone walls. It isn't far, nestled beneath the stairs, a tiny cot a dark wool blanket, an ancient man, sparse hair, long, yellow, white, and gray, a beard, not thick like Santa's, but just as long, and fingers, long like dad's, but joints more pronounced, the flesh now tightly pulled on skeletal frame. Dad speaks in Chinese, in Toy San dialect, telling the old man that we are his children that we are the old man's great nephews and nieces. He looked asleep when we arrived, though who knows how he could sleep in that small place with a cardboard box for a pillow. He's fully awake and struggles to sit up, to look at us with his cloudy eyes. Cataracts make us appear like ghosts, just as he seems ghost-like to us. We stand around awkwardly, not understanding the words, waiting for an indication of what we are to say and do, recalling mother's warnings to be polite and respectful. Dad calls our names and one by one we step closer. A bony hand reaches out, touches a sleeve here, a cuff there. It takes all my self-control to move forward when my turn comes. A few more words are exchanged. The old man relaxes and settles back into his cocoon. Our visit with Agung, 
Great Uncle Wing concludes. Ascending the stairs, our eyes hurt as we emerge into bright daylight. Well, um, he was living with family members, but you know, this was, immigrants didn't thrive. Um, I mean, and he had been one of, uh, one of two uncles that had sponsored my dad when my dad came to Canada in 1923, shortly before the Exclusion Act took place. He was a teenager. So he, you know, he'd worked all his life and uh, in his later years he was living with his children. Um, but, you know, they, they had a house and they rented out a flat and they had kids of their own and there was space in the basement and that's, you know, you didn't have nursing homes like you have today or you couldn't afford them. So that's where he ended up. And it was... It was a scary experience mm -hmm. because we didn't know him and he did seem like a... Well, he's like creature you'd find in the museum, really. Yeah. And this was your introduction to trauma, the big city. Yeah, so this was actually one poem of three that dealt with uh, places we visited in Toronto. So the museum was one, uh, New City Hall would be one, and then the Ontario Place was new. That was the third one. But um, that's the one I want to share. That's great, thanks. I'd like to read three poems tonight. Uh, one's about depression, which is what I struggle with, and the other two are about unrequited love poems to a muse, which is uh, something that I, I might, if I have a bit of time at the end, I might ex explain about, a bit more about. But first, this is a poem about uh, depression. A betrayal of emotions, a lie to every voice. The sun is black. The tedium of life is like a slow death. Nothing changes. It's repetition and eternity. A constant waiting, a constant disappointment in me. Who have I become, yet no longer knowing who I was? The few memories that float on the edges of my existence, no longer recognizable, and old events far removed. Forever the hope of some fast end to this. So that's uh, the one on depression. Um, these are two love poems to a muse who's unaware of uh, that any of, th any of this is being written. So uh, just uh, this is the first one. Tied to a mast of my own hand, unable to blind myself as you curve and blur on wheel wings you erotic, caught, lit by night, on video, on streets, predator of my heart, blind me. And then this is the last one. Night, hot, public pool closed, break and enter into that, coal, that cool water, makes you hot. Moon orgasms fall like silver knives upon waters disturbed by your beauty. Time aligns with the future. You lie after that dark, liquid fuck, creating life in his arms. Thank you. I don't know whether that, how that would be kind of received, to be quite honest with you. Uh, uh, I, I sort of actually have sort of created this avatar of me, which is this sort of older fellow, not that I'm a younger fellow, but there is a sort of 24-year-old in me somewhere. Um, and uh, I get these glimpses of this person on Instagram and uh, respond to the, to, to, to the visuals that I see, mm -hmm. and that creates the poetry that I write. Okay. Um, this memoir is about my son's transition as a transgender boy, and it's a, a kind of recollection of his experiences and our family's reaction to what was transpiring. Um, and when Kuhn mentioned that the theme was neighborhood, 
I thought of this chapter where I talk about my old neighborhood in Hamilton where I grew up and um, sort of my coming of age and, and my realization that things were changing for me as a girl. And um, I'll, just, I'll just get right into it. This is called What Every Girl Learns. As odd as it may seem today, picture a middle-aged, high-femme mom who wears heels and lipstick daily. I was once a somewhat rambunctious tomboy. I climbed trees. I too disdained girly clothes. I played ball on the road and rode my battered bike along the gritty, gritty streets of my neighborhood. I had a fort that my cousin Anna and I visited daily. It was at the top of a garage hidden by a tree, accessed only by another tree, which we scrambled onto through an alley next to the house I grew up in. My hometown neighborhood was not exactly bucolic. It was in somewhat down on its heels, East End Hamilton. The railway tracks were a mere block away. There weren't many parks nearby. We played on the street mostly from the early morning until long into the night by the light of the street lamps in the summers. It was the kind of neighborhood where even the girls got into fist fights at my grade school. The girls were intimidating, tough, violent, fearing no one, not even the boys, especially not some undersized immigrant kid like me who was terrified to cross them. And I was often terrified much of the time. The game I most loved to play was war, using my plastic bucket of green army figures, bayonets at the ready, round American army helmets laden with canteens, images of World War II soldiers in all their glory. I waged war with the neighborhood boys daily in my tiny, lawnless backyard. Perhaps it was a harbinger of things to come, my own torturous emotional relationships with boys and men. In my recollection of this time and this game, my thoughts sometimes drift back to the homeless man who used to haunt the downtown of our city. He was most likely a veteran who had lost his legs decades before in World War II. I only made this connection in my mind many years after I left, but back then he was a terrifying, ruddy-faced force of nature who haunted the streets panhandling. His face, hands, and neck were terribly grimy, as was every aspect of his clothing. He often had a, a battered, dark suit jacket sourced from who knows where. He moved about on a shabby wooden platform with wheels, and he was ferocious. If someone extended a kindness towards him, he would snarl and snap. There was a feral quality to him. Perhaps he was shamed by his own need. I saw him often and never recall him being at peace or smiling in the slightest manner. He was still at war with himself, with those who patronized him with his fate. He was trapped in a body that he never wanted or asked for. How agonizing it must have been for him. Our neighborhood was fairly rough for a kid, comprised of working class immigrant families like ours and some struggling old stock families who didn't like immigrants very much and were outspoken about their dislike. We ate foods that were not considered chic. We turned brown in the sun, not lobster pink. Our grandmothers lived with us. Sometimes they wore somber black. and They did not speak English when accosted by some snotty-nosed, freckled boy's insults on the streets. We were considered foreign and uncool and undesirable and vulnerable. Don't forget vulnerable. I was once ordered out of my neighborhood friend's backyard by her strawberry blonde bouffant coiffed mother for some unknown offense. The incident puzzles me still. Did I turn too brown in the summer sun? Was it because my hair curled and did not lie flat on my shoulders but sprung about my ears in an unruly fashion? Had I matured too quickly, too noticeably for her taste? Was it because my friend and I had once stood on the garbage cans that lined the white wooden fence on her property and peered over the fence into the next yard? I was older than my friend, her name now forgotten, and perhaps her mother thought that I was the instigator of this great crime. Did the accented voice of my parents offend? Did it carry too far over the gentle waves of this woman's well-manicured lawn? Or was it the smell of the foreign food that wafted over? I never learned why I had been banished, but I still recall her icy blue stare as I slunk out of the backyard, never invited to return. That incident, that time, felt like the beginning of the end of something. Too old, perhaps, to play in someone's yard now. Too swarthy, perhaps, to be the little girl's companion. Too mature looking to be innocent. But I assure you, I was. 
I too absolutely loathed the way my body changed when I was 11 or 12, just as Frankie did. That's my son's name. Um, in the book, I use a pseudonym. I developed a bosom and voluptuous curves and elicited the kind of attention that young girls fear and hate at that age. It interfered with the small joyfulness of what my life had been. People treated me differently and I was expected to play by a different set of rules that I resented. I would receive cat calls from some of the local boys whenever I walked down the street by myself. Beyond wolf whistles or attempts to get my attention, crude, insulting remarks that were meant to demean and humiliate, they succeeded admirably in their intent. I retain an aversion to crowds and boys and men, crowds of boys and men on the street, quickly changing sides of the sidewalk if I spot a group of the same. I learned what every girl learns, that your body is not your own. It belongs to whoever feels the need to scrutinize it, desire it, judge it, insult it, even terrorize it. Sometimes the scrutiny was accompanied by a lascivious grin or smirk, sometimes by clear disgust and revulsion. But I soon learned that my body was not solely my own. It belonged to the world. And I remember Frankie's utter horror when we traveled abroad and she and her closest friend, they were not yet 14, were the recipients of a number of lascivious looks, lip licking and smirks. I was shocked when Frankie told me, but I don't believe my sister was. She tried to counsel Frankie. That's what some men are like, she said. You better toughen up and have a pretty tough look for them when they do that to you. She was right, Frankie did have to toughen up. Another thing happened when I hit that magical age of 11 or 12. I was forbidden to play with boys by my mother. I was forbidden to play boy games. I was no longer a girl. I was becoming a woman with all the danger that that implies. Potential sexual contact in pregnancy, or perhaps worse in my mother's eyes, the disgrace of the same in our small, tightly knit community. In a manner, I now sometimes wonder if Frankie's fierce embrace of his transgender identity is an attempt to escape this and some of the ugliness that girls encounter. It's treasonous to speculate this way. The speculation might incense some people. They would suggest that a person is not trans because that person is reacting to a social climate or a specific situation. A trans person is trans because he or she was born this way. But it crossed my mind many times when Frankie came out. How wonderful it would be to escape the daily scrutiny and assessment of one's looks to be the subject and not the object. What a sense of freedom that that would engender. I cannot imagine it. Frankie hates being scrutinized, looked at, commented on, but very much less so in a male identity. Frankie would tell me in an ironic twist that he is often stared at in a hostile manner by the girls and women, but never by boys and men. They, the girls and women, seemingly can't figure out what he is and it is unsettling for them. When I discussed Frankie's gender identity with his doctor, Dr. X, he spoke of the number of young women seeking gender reassignment as, quote, epidemic. Why are so many women turning away from roles and lives as females? Is it because girls finally have viable options? They can transform themselves with their clothes, hair, by surgical means and drugs. They can change their names. Is it because being a female can be challenging, hard, constricting? Is Frankie rejecting not just the body he was born in, but everything about being a girl and a woman? Puberty, menses, mature development, childbirth, menopause, but also judgment, harassment, appraisal, possible violence, and the response to try and conform or not and face the consequences of that decision from society. If a young woman had more options, would she choose this painful course in life? I wondered then, are trans boys opting for the more liberating, albeit challenging, paths as human beings? Was it treasonous of me as his mother to wonder if this was true? At one point, it was almost as if I was trying to convince Frankie that what he disliked about being a girl was what he disliked was what being a girl physically entailed rather than the sense that he was truly a boy. We had long, fruitless arguments where I desperately argued against his revelation and Frankie clung to his assertion that he was a boy. I learned the truth the hard way. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, he's read every word of it. Mm -hmm. He's read multiple drafts. And um, what he wasn't comfortable in, with, I didn't include. Um, so you consulted him from the get-go? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, at one point, I had stopped writing it. 
And then he said, well, why did you stop, Mom? And I said, I don't know. I just <laughs> At one point, I just couldn't keep going. And he said, well, I want you to keep going. Um, because I think he, sometimes we would have these arguments, and they became very heated and angry. Um, but if he read about my concerns on paper, he seemed to be more open. That's interesting. He seemed to be more receptive to what I was feeling at the time and would, would not push back as much. So it helped us to communicate. I would write it down, he would read it, and we would talk about it. So I think we've always been close. It's just, you know, as, as a, a person that wasn't trans and had no experience of it, I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel comfortable, mm -hmm. and I was pushing back, um, and that was that was infuriating him because I was resisting it and trying to, you know, it's like, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe if you just change this, she'll be okay, you know, instead of just opening myself up and saying, okay, it's you need to do this. I get, I understand now, but it took a it took a while. Um, it's a little awkward reading it. <laughs> yeah. I feel comfortable writing it. I feel a little uneasy reading it sometimes. I picked a very personal thing to read, and I'm a little worried, but actually, when I think about it, everybody who read in the first half read something fairly personal, so I am going to take courage from that. I can't ask questions of myself at the end, you know, even though I'm a great host. <laughs> So you can, you're welcome to ask me any questions that you like. Uh, what I'm reading, I don't think I've ever read aloud before. It was in, do you remember when the Globe and Mail had that facts and arguments thing at the back of this? Yeah, it was something I got in the facts and arguments thing. It's more than 10 years old. It was, I'd maybe had a few things in newspapers, but I was just very much desperate to be a writer and wasn't really sure who I am. I know you look at me and... You think that guy's Irish for sure, but I was, I'm Tamil, I was born in Sri Lanka, our family came here and um, you know that was a fair part of growing up and who I was. So this, the connection to Toronto is, I was really trying to figure things out and then I went to go see a psychiatrist, uh, which wasn't that fruitful, but she had me try antidepressants, as psychiatrists are wont to do, which didn't really work for me. So I thought I'd write about being on an antidepressant and visiting my family out in suburban Scarborough. So that's my Toronto connection, because it's very much about Scarborough, which I tend to write about a lot, and being Tamil. My poor father, who so wanted his son to be a doctor, got a patient instead. Some things you need to know about my father. He got a PhD late in life in a country that was not his own. Looked for work afterward in a few more countries and when he couldn't find it, settled in Canada where he completely changed his profession. When I follow him down a grocery aisle or help him around the garden and see his slightly balding pate and the remaining air assiduously dyed black bobbing in front of me, this is what I think. This is the man who was flexible enough to go back to school and completely start his life over in a foreign country for us. I unscrew the childproof cap and look at the two grand pink antidepressant capsules in my palm. Underneath a large stylized W is written the word Effexor and the number 37.5. It's hard to believe that within these tiny containers rests the power to influence millions of neurons and their synapses. I don't understand, says my father, and indeed he doesn't. He is a man who has withstood ten times the stress and hardship that I have, and he would do a thousand things differently in my circumstances. Why cannot his son pick even one of them? But then again, I do not have the resilience and flexibility he has. To say that I held off from trying medication for 30 years is no accomplishment. The paralysis and inability to move always come back to the same point. So I visit on weekends and instead of talking, help my father with the garden. He wants a stone border to go around the flowers. I am sent to get the measuring tape. Ten feet the length of the patch, one and a half feet the width. Are you going to the store, asked my mother, sticking her head outside. Pick up some fruits and vegetables for me. 
Write down what you want and hurry, says my father. The store is going to close soon. He is such a methodical man. My mother rushes inside and comes back out with a piece of paper. What is written on it? The words fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Don't ask why my mom did that. There's just no explaining some of the things she does. My father stares at her in disbelief. What is wrong with you, he asks. My sister, taking a break and accompanying us, drives us to the garden center. Our father outpaces us and is far ahead as he walks around looking for garden decorations. How are you holding up, my sister asks. Has the medication kicked in yet? Oh yes, I've been feeling loopy all morning. Why don't you just stop on a lower dose then, asks my father, coming up suddenly. I don't understand why the doctor wants to keep increasing the dose. I'm supposed to take an extra pill a week for the first three weeks. I'm supposed to climb the effects or steps until my medication peaks at an effective dosage. Feeling the tape measure in my pocket, I take it out and measure the distance between my sister and my father. 28 inches. I have no idea what my father wants from this place. Lawn decorations. Will he finally get the plastic flamingos and the stone gnomes that signify we have assimilated into North American suburbia? <laughs> Not likely. Despite his remarkable flexibility, my father is the most particular, precise, exacting, demanding person I know. He is not one to give over his lawn to generic ornaments and random bric-a-brac. I am the one who is happy being Canadian and generally accepting of everything, yet I can seem to find no place, no job or career, hence the medication. Nothing at the garden center suits my father for his border, and he just picks up some seeds. I measure the distance between their shoulders as we stand in the checkout queue, 17 inches. On the way back home, we stop at the market to pick up a random assortment of fruits and vegetables for my mother. How are you feeling, asks my sister as she drives home. Manic, I reply, and measure the distance between her and my dad, 14 inches. The distance between her and my dad seems to get closer as she gets older, while I just get further and further away. Why is that? We both had the same parents, some of the same experiences. I once thought I was more like my mother. Although they might be crazy in their own small way, my family would never take medication to keep from falling apart. And yet, they've been some of the people most adamant that I should try it. I've realized that things don't come easily. Vocation, family cohesion, success, these are not birthrights. You have to work at them and work at being flexible. And if that means taking medication, I never would have before, so be it. Of the possible side effects, I'm exhibiting slightly less than half of them. It's impossible to think straight or get work done. My sister offers to teach me how to play Texas Hold'em poker instead. What are we going to use for chips, she asks. What about my meds, I reply. Very carefully, on a large, clean sheet of paper, we parcel out the pink and gray pills. My sister ends up winning the first game and takes away all my pills. <laughs> if it were only that easy. However, while she's teaching me, I don't need a tape measure. I marvel at how near our heads get when we're closest to each other, six or seven inches. So. Um, I would say it's more the other. If I would guess, I would guess that the sadness is like a baseline, which I constantly feel about things and the world and the way the world is and so on. But the humor comes from wanting to like, you know, riff off of that and like flights of fancy and absurdist notions and things like that. And it's a way to play with that because there's a kind of part of me that's kind of manic or electric. Less so as I get older, but certainly likes to, you know, play with that. Yeah. I mean, if you're curious, I'm even less close to my sister uh, and my dad now. Uh, I'm very distant from them. But I haven't been in therapy for years. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I think and I think writing has helped me process a lot of that, um, you know, for sure, for sure. Well, part of it was I think just the stigma culturally. Um, I medication never really worked for me, especially because it fogged me up, and that got in the way of doing things which were very important to me, whether they were creative or just expressing myself or being in the moment. Um, 
and I just don't think it was just clinical for me. I think like there were a lot of things in my early life that were very hard. That were, emotionally, I was just wired that way, like I was affected by them and so on. Um, but yeah, the best thing that ever worked for me was CBT therapy because I like talking and expressing. And what I loved about CBT therapy was it was only 13 sessions and you were forced to change something. Right, you're forced to work on something, and I love that because I love, I love, you know, sinking my hands in and 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 doing doing something. But you know, the great currents in your life don't really change. You're sort of like, you know, there they are there are those baselines, and if you sort of accept them, and you are a bit playful with them, which I like to be in my writing and in real life, I think I think that helps a lot. Like at this point, I don't I don't want to be you know, Justin Timberlake. I don't, I don't want, like, I want to be Mark Sampson, but I can't. And I accept that, yes. I mean, I, I had some pretty dark patches early on, so I think my parents were just happy if I was going to a doctor. But for them, that was like it was cured, because they weren't able to, like, see it in some kind of complex or nuanced way. They were just like, he needs help, and he's going, it's like if your car's broken, you go to the mechanic. And they didn't really understand that it was a process, and it was a trial and error, and it was working through things, and because part of that problem was my relationships with them, and they couldn't work on that, it was sort of a, it was sort of a way of pushing it to the side, I think, for them. But that's my own interpretation of how they, because like if I ever ask my dad, like I think you've got a lot of anxiety, like it's very hard for him to talk about that kind of stuff or talk about things in a detached kind of way. And he hated that piece. Like I remember presenting that to him, and I don't present my writing anymore because I just know that you know it's not for them, and that's fine. But um, I remember and I'm being heartbroken that he hated it. You know, because it was just too much scrutiny and it was too much like opening the outside to, you know, even though I think it's kind of a sweet, loving portrayal of him, mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't see it that way. And that's too bad. You know, but it is what it is. He can do things I can't. I, I was kind of raised comfortably middle class in... in London, Ontario, and then as soon as I moved out at like 16 or 17, I got really poor, and I've been really poor ever since then. So you it's always literature, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually hated school so much. I, I I left myself one credit short from graduating from high school because mm -hmm. I knew that the onus would be on me to go to university, and I didn't. Want that. <laughs> I was like way too way too clever for my own good. Like, I could just go to night school, get that one credit. Oh, I did. I went oh, back. I went back when I was 23, and I was considered a mature student, so it no longer mattered. So I could have gone to university anyway. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, uh, recently I moved to Greenwood and Danforth, but before that I was in uh, Parkdale. Um, I, loved, I love Parkdale, I love the area I'm in now. Uh, I love that as a white girl I can wander around all day, not see another white face and not hear a word of English spoken. It's, it's good for people. It's, I think that a lot of what you guys are doing here is just getting people out of their bubbles and that's very important. Um, and I wrote this when I was, uh, when I was living there and uh, used to walk down to the water just close to the, um, the old bath house, the old beach house down there. It's called My Taste. Would be more acceptable if it was only my own. If I was stating my disgust with brown bedding or floppy hats, my love of strappy sandals and a sunset with boats sailing through. But my taste isn't only my taste. It wants to look at the bigger picture. Those tall yachts are a lifestyle I can't fathom so to speak, not when I compare it to the place I stand and the disadvantaged folk sharing this beach with me. What place do strappy sandals have in a world where having shoes at all can make the difference between going to school or not, and having good work boots can mean the difference between having a job and going hungry, and every year you don't have those boots, adding to the likelihood that you'll fall further away from any job, from any chance of a livelihood. How can I justify a preference for this bottle of water over that when tap water runs free and clean, uh, when water runs free and clean from my taps? My taste likes to remind me of that good fortune 
when I consider water from a store. My taste never stops reminding me that it is a luxury that others don't possess. I'll exercise it with restraint until everyone can have their own. Um, this is, uh, you inspired my choice of reading for the little bit of prose, um, um, and let me know if I'm running out of time. But. Gavin may let you know, but don't worry. <laughs> Um, this is from a, a story called um, The Inner Life of Owl Woman about a uh, superheroine and a supervillainess who become good friends and end up changing the world by accident. Uh, the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me as a young superheroine took place about three blocks from the shop where I get my pataks. I had moved to Parkdale to be closer to the crime I meant to fight. It was either that or Jane and Finch, but I've always been a downtown girl. Parkdale was even less gentrified than it is now, and if you know it, you'll excuse me for saying that it's about a half step above dirt, poor, and dangerous. It has its she-she galleries and its organic coffee, of course, but no one forgets which building has the highest murder rates, or which landlords attract crack dens, or where that little girl was beaten and starved to death by her foster folks. I'm not saying it's bad by US inner city standards, but it's bad for Toronto. Bad-ish, maybe. And I grew up not far away in High Park, hearing how nasty Parkdale was. So I guess it was the first place that I thought of when I suddenly could fly and rotate my head around all of 172.25 degrees. I know, I've been measured. So I was out doing what I thought was I was supposed to be doing, patrolling my pitch. There's no skyscrapers on that stretch of King, so I was perched atop a three-story split usage. Okay, this guy, dreads the middle of his back, skin almost as dark as his black sweats, goes flying by, red kids tearing up the pavement. This guy could run. I hear the whine of police sirens from the direction he was coming at near superhero speed. The guy, not the cops. Whatever he'd done, the cops weren't going to catch him without me. I launched myself with a push of my extra powerful legs, a little extra boost coming from the strength of my flexible feet. Yeah, the boots were stacked, but they also took my peculiar physiognomy into account. And I took him down mid-step. Not wanting to damage him, I pulled up into the air as I knocked him over so that we had a split second of airbone hover before I laid him out. The cop cars wind up and right on by. I was so perplexed, I let the guy sit up on his own. What the hell did you do that for, he said, rubbing the shoulder where I'd tackled him. Why were you running, I said trying to sound as self-important as I could while crouching on the pavement with one leg splayed out behind me and a guy in custody who didn't look at all worried about being caught. Jogging, he said. You hear about it? Good for the body. Usually, he groaned. <laughs> and I helped him up. Tried to give him 20 bucks to say I was sorry, but all he'd accept was a free coffee coupon from the nearest organic place I'd recently scored as a thank you. That was the last time I leapt before I looked. Before I thought things through, I mean. <laughs> okay. oh, good. Um, I think the worst thing that, I mean, when I first started coming to Toronto younger, um, the, there weren't all those condos down by the waterfront. The, um, I just keep watching what's happening with these, with these condo buildings going up and these tiny little weird spaces where people that make so much money live. and. And it wouldn't be a problem if they didn't expect people who didn't make very much money who have to come in from the suburbs to serve them coffee at minimum wage. Like it wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have a problem with it if it wasn't for the fact that, that anybody who's making that much money seems to rely on the people who aren't making very much money to, to be there to be the support staff. No, I just moved to, uh, well, I just moved to, um, I don't know, I call it Ethiopia town because it's like Ethiopian restaurants and I, I love it. Like it's funny, there's a, there was a coffee shop in Parkdale that I loved run by this. Queen Queen West. I lived at, I lived at uh, kind of at the, like right near the corner of Roncesvalles and, and yeah, Kings. So saying. yeah, so yeah, like yeah. the poorest part of it. Like sure. it's like there's the shishi and then the shishi and then they kind of meet where there's like no shishi. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> Not sushi, but no sushi. Well, actually, there's a guy. There's a really good sushi chef wow. there too, but, but that's a, that's totally beside the point. But yeah, no, I just I I I don't know. I'm I'm not really comfortable with um, yeah. with conspicuous consumption in any form. Um, I think because because I've I've because I I know that there's unrealistic salaries, and I know that 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 and it's unrealistic housing and renting. Yeah. yeah. And, and if, you make, if you make more money than you need, suddenly you need more. And, 
and there's a very, but there's a, a very real huge number of people that barely make enough for what they actually really do need. Yeah. It's the thing that breaks my heart about Toronto too. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and um, the thing with mental illness too is that I, I think I, I learned that while I was the sickest, when I, when I was at the point where my depression wouldn't le let me leave the apartment, um, there, mu there were lots of resources for me, but I didn't know about them, couldn't find out about them, and couldn't have accessed them even if I, even if I tried. Like I couldn't have, I couldn't have made it out to. So I know that the people that are the worst off are the ones that, that actually can't get help, and I think it's pretty, it's pretty bad for when a society expects the people who fall into the cracks to climb out of the cracks in order to get help. Uh, hello everybody, thank you for coming and thank you for inviting me home. It was very nice to get just an email out of the blue. <laughs> and, um, I've never been inside an ad agency and it, it <laughs> kind of looks as I imagined it would. Like fancy, but cool, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, what I'm reading is, uh, and thank you for holding my mic, uh, uh, an excerpt from a novel manuscript that I've been working on and I'm finished now and, you know, shopping for home for it. Um, maybe the only bit of inf information to know is, I use the term Habesha in here, and uh, maybe you might have heard it, and <laughs> it just generally means a uh, person of Ethiopian or Eritrean background. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's a, the narrator is a flight attendant, that might help to know, and... Um, For which airline? Hmm? Which airline? Can Air <laughs> doesn't exist. <laughs> That's a Canadian airline, uh, and uh, yeah, it just happens to be a part of the manuscript, which is set in Toronto. So I was glad to have it available to read today. <clears throat> in the Greek town book city, I was browsing for the book my mother Amma wanted in the remaining hardcovers at amazing prices stack. My radar, a reflex learned in childhood and honed at work, was on identifying potential crazies, remaining aware of exits. One guy stayed too long at the stack without once glancing my way, tall and slim, jeans and t-shirt selected with casual care, cloth bag, beard, vaguely habesha. I moved away through cards, notebooks, new arrivals. He kept reappearing and different to me, like the love interest in a habesha music clip. After finding and paying for the book at the cash register, where he stood behind me, I saw him ahead of me on Bloor Street, walking towards Broadview Station. We got on the westbound train. I got off at Bathurst. So did he. I stopped at the bakery. He came in. Then I saw him waiting for my northbound bus, munching on a spicy beef patty, which I knew by the red dot. Aboard the bus, I sat where I had a good view of him. He opened the book he bought. It was the same book I had bought. I walked over to where he sat and clutched a support pole. Habesha dudes usually open with, don't I know you? I said, have you met me? He allowed five seconds to lapse, the standard for an ignored crazy to move on, before lifting his attention from the acknowledgements page. Are you Habesha? I could have answered yes or no. Whichever answer I chose, it would be half true. No, I said, turning away. Excuse me. Or does it depend on who's asking? I sat across the aisle, trying to make it seem like I just chose to sit there because there happened to be an empty seat. That must be why you're following me. You're pretty keyed up for someone so young. Our eyes connected. I knew he meant that old school paranoia of our parents' generation, the ones that lived the red terror during the changeover from monarchy to military rule. The young and innocent, or old and accomplished, had had a way of being led into a disappearing fate by terror squads on the hunt for suspected anti-revolutionaries. That tension had seeped down into us, the next generation, evidently staining some more deeply than others. I just sensed you wanted to, to speak to me, I said. Only if you're Habesha, he winked. I am, by the way, stating the obvious, but mixed, Italian. That's rare, I said. The Italians had been making love and war in Ethiopia and Eritrea for over a century. He picked up on my sarcasm. Let me guess, I wouldn't be your grandfather's favorite person? Probably true, once invaded, forever wounded, as they say, but I only have the one. 
Shalika, my grandfather, had been on my mind of late, thanks to one of my holiday phone calls to him, when he had updated me about the expected success of his campaign to reclaim the Axum Obelisk from Rome, where it had decorated a roundabout, since the Italian, Shalika's comrade's way of saying Italian, looters took it during the occupation at the start of the Second World War. Every repatriation committee or commission that was set up, he was on it. Every letter or petition that was prepared, he signed. The obelisk was finally being returned. It only took 68 years. The man introduced himself as Isaac. We swayed in time as the bus let out an airy fart and lurched out of the station. I glanced at the open book on his lap. You read. He jerked his chin forward, shocked by my bluntness. I pulled Amma's book out of my bag and brandished it in his face, as if it were my passport to his company for the bus ride. Same bookshop, same book. You didn't see me? Using his thumb as a bookmark, he closed his copy and placed it next to mine. You're right. We could have just bought one and saved the money. <laughs> I leafed through the book. The, the ease of his we tripped me up. I had, to be be, I had to be busy with something. He watched me in a way that I didn't mind. You're a Buddhist, I said. No, are you? Me? No, I just picked this up for my Ethiopian Orthodox Christian mother. Why did you say me like that? Ever heard of any Ethiopian Buddhists? Faiths, not that I think Buddhism is one, are more similar than different. Listening to him intellectualize religion, I felt I was encountering a very young version of my father, Appa. There you go with the obvious again. Anyway, you thought I was Buddhist, didn't you? I nodded. And your mother seems as if she's interested, if indeed that's who it's for, or else she wouldn't have asked for it. He held up two long fingers as symbols of his two well-made points. His nails were long, clean ovals. There was a green ink stain on the inside flesh of his index finger that I wanted to suck clean. You got me, I conceded. Oh, come on, fight with me. What for? You must be an only child. Maybe. I have five sisters. Whoa. <laughs> I would have envied him one, yes, but five seemed gluttonous. Where? All back home. He checked the upcoming stop. Let me know what you think of the book once you're finished. I'm not much of a reader, I said. I took out a pen and poised it over the inside flap of his book, intending to write my phone number. He repositioned my hand over his inner wrist, where his skin was warm, and took to the ink on the first stroke. On the bus, my comment about his reading had reminded Isaac about his first year at Yale, where he was on a full scholarship for graduate studies in geology. The innuendos he'd received then had been more sophisticated. Within those vaunted halls, they had to be. He felt them most acutely in the difference between what people explained to him versus what they assumed he already knew, being African. No, it's not. It, I've only just started that process. It's only been about a year that I've been trying it. And, I've learned it's very slow, um, and all the, the the lengthy silences are always followed by no. <laughs> um, so I've learned to just be patient and um, not get excited at, at every slightly pos possible positive outlook of things, mm. because it's just until there's ink on the paper. <laughs> yeah, I've just learned to... It's been an adjustment, definitely, it because, definitely yeah, yeah, it, I've never had that experience of sending something, short stories, yes, but something like this, the, the wait is longer, and it's been a whole other education. Um. Mm, yes, uh, they, 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 I've had friends and, and family members who've read it, um, they haven't had any negative reaction, and I don't know what the community's reaction will be at all. I've learned that you can never anticipate reactions. People surprise you. This is actually uh, my old neighborhood. I, I used to live at Danforth in Maine before I moved in with my wife. So when I saw the address, I thought, oh, okay, I know, I know where I am. Um, but uh, in 2011, my, my wife and I moved in together um, in St. Jamestown, which is, uh, which is where we are now. And uh, the scene from this book um, that I'm going to read uh, tonight is uh, set in an adjacent neighborhood called Cabbage Town. <laughs> and if you know anything about this part of Toronto, you know that these are very 
different neighborhoods. And uh, I, like, I like to joke that I live in one of the truly mixed income communities <laughs> in the city because we, we have it all within a very, very short um, uh, group of blocks. So um, the, the book is called The Slip and it's about a university professor at the, Uf at the University of Toronto named Philip Sharp. He's a philosophy professor. And he, uh, he is also a bit of a kind of a heavyweight intellectual, public intellectual, who's often appearing on the news, you know, um, giving his commentary on, on whatever is happening. And um, the story is about um, an incident that happens uh, when he's been um, summoned to the CBC to um, debate uh, one of his fiercest rivals on the right. Um, and uh, he, over the course of this interview, um, interview says, something absolutely awful to this female rival. And he isn't even really aware that he has said it. And the social media fervor of that uh, explodes and all of a sudden um, uh, everybody's sort of hounding for his blood. Um, and this scene is set the day after that happens. Um, no, pardon me, uh, this happens three days after that happens, my mistake. Um, and uh, just to set this scene up, uh, Philip, uh, knows that on this particular evening um, there is a protest happening against him at U of T. And uh, one of his loyal grad students has said, you should come to your own protest and talk to these people and s smooth all this out. Um, but he has also promised to take his stepdaughter somewhere. And this is a promise that has been in play for quite a while. And so the previous chapter has ended with him debating whether to go to this protest and try to end the fervor or keep a, a promise to his 13-year-old stepdaughter. This is how it went down last night. We strolled Metcalf Street together through Autumn's great Chikayash girl, the orange canopy of leaves releasing their strange light despite the fallen dusk, and talked about the movement of bodies. This had all started two months ago with Grace reluctantly allowing Simone to take Black Swan out of the library, which, upon viewing, led to an obsession. This then precipitated a request to order old copies of Fame on DVD from Amazon. The show's theme music became the soundtrack of our house for weeks and provided Simone with a kind of focus that warmed us as parents. I'm gonna live forever she sang at us, I'm going to learn how to fly. But then came the doubt. Where does the 13-year-old learn doubt? Turned out, her best friend Sarah, in that pish ha tone of hers, said that Simone was too old to get interested in dance, that most girls start a ballet at less than a quarter of her age. Grace had not put Simone in ballet as a toddler, perhaps including it in her princess band. But we said, look, if you want to be in dance, we can put you in dance, just for fun. I don't know, she said. Simone, there's a huge studio right at the end of our street, uh, I reminded her. Why don't we go to a recital and see if you're really into it? She grew animated by this idea. You take me, she asked. Grace answered for me. She said, yes, Philip will take you. She said, Philip, you take Simone to a dance recital, wouldn't you? Absolutely, I replied. I will absolutely take my stepdaughter to a dance recital. So there we were, walking down Metcalf and talking about arabesques and pas de chevals and all the rest with Simone doing little demonstrations for me in the street. I was touched that she wanted to share this neophyte fixation with me and have us spend some quality time together. But I also felt a bit scandalous, knowing that the protest against me was happening at that very moment back at U of T, and I wasn't there. I was here, here, supporting this bright, enthusiastic young human like a good stepdad should. We arrived for the show to find only a short lineup. The Toronto Dance Studio was, a huge, was in a huge old church its bell tower seeming to look out over the entire neighborhood. I was getting a few stares from other people in the line, but they <coughs> held their tongues at the sight of my now notorious visage, perhaps because I had a young child in tow. Simone and I worked our way to the box office in the crammed, cramped lobby, purchased our tickets, and took our programs, and then were led into the main studio space. A large riser took up half the room, and beyond it, were the church's stained glass windows that faced the street, now black boxed by long, dark curtains. As we climbed the riser and found some seats, I spotted the small bar set up on the far side of the room. I said to Simone, do you want a drink? And she said, sure, a Coke. And I said, great, I'll be right back. I climbed down the riser and got in line at the bar. Stepping up, I could, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw that the best liquor they could manage was the Johnny Walker Red. So I ordered a double. 
After paying for it, I started to go, but then spun on my heels and cut back to the front of the line. Oh, and a Coke, sorry, I said. I paid for it and then double-fisted my way back up this, to my seats, to our seats. <coughs> I handed Simone her drink and she sipped at it slowly, looking around that massive room with her big green eyes. Soon the lights fell and the show started. I must confess that while I am progressive and open-minded, I don't really have a taste for what one might politely call the alternative arts. I, cr <laughs> I cringe away from the spoken rant artists who now infect our literary festivals. I tend not to give change to the unemployed millennial singing opera in a cape on College Street. This show proved more alternative than anticipated. The troupe stormed the stage with great violence, swinging their limbs in the air and then falling to the floor dramatically, forming their arms into pods while some sort of atonal music, mostly squeals and long bleeps, blared above them. And then back up the dancers went, swerving and melting into each other's bodies, then pulling away and ducking behind clenched forearms as if blocking a punch, and then back up and throwing their bosoms open to the world. Around and around they went as they spun and clenched and ached. This went on for 45 minutes. And then the lights went up for the intermission. What do you think? I whispered to Simone as the small audience began to mill. She took a final thoughtful sip of her Coke. I'll reserve judgment to the end, she said, in an obvious and adorable parroting of grace. I beamed at her. What a kid. Do you want a fresh Coke? No, I'm OK, thanks. I went to the bar anyway for another double Johnny and made it back to my seat just as the lights dimmed. The second half was more of the same but only lasted 30 minutes. When it was over, we stood to go, but kept our opinions to ourselves until we were out of earshot of the other audience members. Most seemed to be, based on the congratulatory hugs and reunions that happened in front of the stage, friends and or family of the dancers themselves. So, I said, as we strolled back down Metcalf Street, what did you think? Simone pondered for a bit. Well, I guess I kept looking for the story, she said. I mean, was there supposed to be a story? I don't think so, I replied. With stuff like that, we're not really supposed to look for a narrative. What do you mean? Well, it's like when we go to the art gallery and look at the abstract stuff. It isn't a linear thing, right? It doesn't have, you know, a rising action, climax, and all that. You just take it in all at once. This is sort of the same thing. When you watch dance like that, you have to imagine the performers are clutching paintbrushes in their hands and their feet. As they move their bodies around, you should try to imagine the abstract picture they're painting for you. And I mimic some interpretive dance to demonstrate, which made Simone laugh. That makes a lot of sense, she said. Still, and here she thought and thought, maybe dance isn't for me. You know, it's okay if it isn't. She paused again. Maybe I should be a zoologist, you know, when I grow up. You could be a dancing zoologist. Hmm, no, maybe just a zoologist. Well, you do love animals, I said thinking of how well Simone took care of our family cat, Constance, which was her chief household chore. I do love animals, she agreed. And then, apropos of this, said, Philip, do you think I'm too young to read Life of Pi? <laughs> what? No, fuck no, you're super smart, you could read Life of Pi. She nodded once more. I think I'll read Life of Pi. And then we were home. When we came in, Grace looked up from the novel she was reading in the living room and said, how was it? And Simone answered, it was weird. And we hugged, <clears throat> excuse me, hung up our coats, and I kicked off my payless. Simone descended into the living room just as Grace was unpretzeling herself from her reading chair, and the two shared a mother-daughter hug. It's past your bedtime, Grace said, and Simone nodded in acquiescence. But before she headed upstairs, she paid a visit to the enormous overflowing bookshelves along our living room wall, found the M's in fiction, and pulled down the tome she wanted. Are you going to read that? Grace smiled. I'm going to try, Simone said. As she headed up to her room, she said, thanks for taking me, Philip. And I said, anytime, kiddo. And then Grace and I were alone. Is Naomi down? I asked. Down and out, just one story, and she was done. Grace hooked her hip into mine and took my fingers into hers. You did the right thing, she said, looking at me with those eyes. I nodded. Yeah, I had done the right thing. Can you help me with the recycling? She asked, and I followed her into the kitchen. There was a tiny swagger to Grace's walk as she looked over her shoulder at me, at my furry, shambling state. She giggled. I giggled back. What were we laughing at? The quiet of the house, this instance alone, this moment of forgiveness washing over us like a wave? 
She squatted at the cupboard under the sink while I fetched a couple of blue bags from their place in the pantry. As Grace tossed the clapped cereal boxes and empty Jameson bottles and yesterday's newspapers between my open arms, I thought, yes, there was a wave of forgiveness washing over us and something else washing in. Grace's chest brushed against mine as she reached deep into the cupboard for a rogue cat food can that had fallen behind the blue bin. She came back up and tossed the can into the bag, then paused, looked at my mouth. I looked at hers. Then she took up the second recycling bag, and I grabbed the other bin, also overflowing, in both hands. Grace opened the bag to me, and I raised it up, and then just shook, <clears throat> and just, excuse me, and just spilled the whole bin out, giving it a good, manly shake. She set the bag, now heavy, on the floor. You'll take them out? She asked, and I nodded. She stepped into me, grazed her hand around the doughy mound of my stomach. Okay, I'll see you up there then. Neither of us moved, and we laughed again, in unison. What were we laughing at? She slinked back to the living room and up the stairs, and I hastily tied up the recycling bags to run them outside. When I joined Grace upstairs a few minutes later, we still had the ensuite rituals to go through, the taking of vitamins, the brushing of teeth, the cursed flossing. But then we hurried into bed together. It had been several days for us, and certainly not since my TV appearance on Monday. And yet, does it count as forgiveness sex? if the forgiveness doesn't hold. Think about that. You slip into slumber with your wife in your arms after an energetic bout of fucking, then stir in the night to find her awake and staring at you. There has been a shift in her disposition. She wants to talk. She wants to talk, and you, by God, want to listen. But the evening's depletions haul you back down into the selfishness of sleep. Stir again, hours later, and she's still awake and now angry at you, or at least annoyed, this is what being in a marriage has taught you, that you have the capacity to annoy the person you love even while unconscious. <laughs> okay, Grace, you think? Let's do it, let's have it out, clear the air between us. Who cares if it's 4 a.m.? But no, sleep owns you, and before you know it, it's morning. You wake to the sound of her up and in the ensuite, the swill of sink water, the swish of her bathrobe, the toilet's jet-powered flush. She comes out and stands, at the foot of your bed to take one last shot at engaging you, and you make every effort to, <clears throat> to rouse yourself, but you can't, and it's too late anyway. She has mother work to do, and like any woman whose chief function is mother work, she needs to confront the day with a certain amount of urgency. Thanks. For this book, I think Philip's voice very much arrived first. I think, I mean, I had, a, I had a vague sense of what his predicament was going to be in this book and the, the, the problematic relationship he has with his, his wife, Grace. Um, but I think really um, what drove me to this story was I had gotten an, an inkling of what his overeducated, pretentious, upper middle class, completely oblivious to many, many things going on around him voice was. And I was so fascinated by that and the fun I could have with it. I think that's really what brought me to the story. But then as I worked on it more and more and began to grapple with these ideas of like, mm -hmm. you know, men saying awful things and not being um, aware of how their words can be so hurtful, especially to those that they care about, um, or how other people can react and the way things can uh, escalate and really um, become a, a huge sort of um, cultural phenomenon uh, if you're in a, a position of power. Like that, the, the deeper levels of the novel, I think, eventually work themselves out. And so I was able to, you know, have the voice and that scenario kind of work in tandem. Um, yeah, it's been, it, it's been interesting because people have, uh, have asked me if this is a uh, um, the term of the, ro the Romano Clay, the, 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 yeah, the, um, the, you know, the, the idea that you're rendering something that's happened out in the world into, into fiction. Um, but it's funny because every time someone asks me about it, it's about a different situation. You know, mm -hmm. at first it was about a U of T professor who said some horrible things and had his reputation right. ruined, and then it was somebody else, and then it was somebody else over the course of the writing. And then there's the long period while you're waiting after it's finished for it to come out, and there's more things that happen. You're so, just mining an evergreen Yes, thing. it felt like that, very Males much so. stupid things well, constantly yeah. constantly Yeah, so it, it was sort of, it felt, it felt at once very current, but it also felt like something that I could say 
maybe some larger things about how I feel about this and, mm. and the, the effects that I've seen this kind of behavior have on people I care about. Mm. And um, so yeah, and have some fun too with, with him. Philip isn't all bad, like he has that moment uh, one of his $10 words is uh, agonoresis, where he realizes, that's from ancient Greek, that moment, like think of King Lear when he realizes that, you know, which daughter has been loyal to him the whole time, that, you know, that moment of, of realization. Um, and he, you know, to his credit, he's absolutely appalled when he, when he understands what he's done, and he really makes an effort to make amends. So the novel kind of pivots on that, not to give too much away. Um, but uh, in the meantime, yeah, I wanted, I wanted his behavior and his situation to be a bit evergreen in that sense. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of different topics and, and the recalcitrance of men is one of them. And I think I'm really interested in how um, we can, those of us who are in a, a position of privilege, in a position of power oftentimes, the, the thing that we fear most is change. And I really, really love writing about people. I'm writing a novel, I'm writing a science fiction parody right now um, where the main character is seeing the world around him tra change in such dramatic ways and so quickly and he's thrown completely for a loop by that and just it destroys his sense of self. And I'm really interested in how people grapple with change, especially when you know, they have been in those positions and those comfortable states and, and all of a sudden life is very uncomfortable for them. Mm -hmm. So I think when I do write about um, th that issue of, of the sort of the male perspective or whatever, I am interested in that idea of, be, of being made uncomfortable, of self-sabotage, of, of, of ruin. Like all three of my novels feature someone ruining their career. A reviewer pointed this out, I didn't even notice it, but all three books have somebody who, who you know, absolutely sabotages their, their own livelihood, right? Um, and I just think this is a, a very fertile ground I, I keep wanting to come back to over and over again. Uh, to illustrate this, my answer to this question, I, I think I'll, I'll turn to my second novel, which is called Sad Peninsula, which is uh, uh, set in South Korea. Um, and it's a, a very, you know, sort of big, complicated novel with two timelines and two protagonists, one of which with a very different background than I have. Um, and it took a lot of, uh, a lot of work, a lot of research um, to write a novel about this, the subject matter of that, of that book. And the, and the writing itself took a long time as well. Um, but for that book, it took almost as long for it to come out as it did to write, you know. Um, between, fi you know, finding a publisher who was interested, then that publisher saying, no, actually, now that I've read the thing that you've described to me, I'm not interested, and then finding another publisher. And then their response, and, I'm, and all writers probably go through this, right? The length of the response. And then the acceptance is like the happiest day of your life, right? You're, or, you know, second happiest day because, you know, before the thing comes out. Um, but you don't, if, I was kind of naive at that point. I didn't realize how long the process could be from even the acceptance to the time that it hit the bookstores, which for me was two and a half years, which is a, like, and that, I mean, there was an editing process and so forth, but not two and a half years worth. It was really just being in the queue and waiting for the book to come out. Yeah, and now, by, now the queues are so long. And the queues are so long. For those of you who are interested in getting published, like this is just the reality of it, right? Um, and uh, um, it's it almost to the point where you're out promoting the book and you feel like you don't even really know it anymore. You've moved on to other things and you're, you're hitting the road with this book, but you've, you know, you're working on three others you know, over the last two years, right? Um, so it, it can be a bit challenging. You have to prepare yourself for that, I think, as a, as a writer. Having said that, being published is pretty awesome. And being able to share work with people is really great. And having this kind of evening is, is it makes it all worthwhile, you know. It was very hard for me to find a publisher because in pop culture, vampire mythology is very European based. And to mix other cultures into it, uh, the publishers were telling me it's too difficult for them to explain to the audience, how are we going to sell this, etc. So I ran a crowdfunding campaign. I ran a Kickstarter. I raised a couple thousand dollars and I decided to open my own company to publish di diverse books. So um, then I ended up publishing my friend who's a sci-fi writer, Derwin, Derwin Mack, um, because he had been looking for publishers for his work and he writes hard science fiction. He's won awards too, but he's still having a hard time finding a publisher. So I publish him and, um, and, having, and now that I'm doing an anthology where I get submissions, I sort of understand 
why it's so hard. I mean, publishing is still like rolling a dice. It's a gambling game. So nine out of 10 will fail, like the books. So one might make you some money, but yeah, it is. So it's very tough for publishers to find something to think, you know, for them to sell. The same thing with finding an agent. A lot of publishers won't talk to you unless you have an agent, but for them, like they're selling you. So if they don't think it's gonna sell, they're not gonna take your manuscript. So it's sort of weird that, uh, that the publishing industry makes any money at all, really. But, um, but it's very uh, difficult to break into. But I think once you, I think you just have to start. At the end of the day, like I have an American friend, she keeps sending me emails, like how to make a million dollars from your writing, blah, blah, blah. I was like, look, at the end of the day, you gotta write, you have to start. So just get it done, you know, have some friends look at it, edit a bit. Just keep sending it, just keep trying. I think over time, you'll build up your portfolio and you'll be able to publish. So just get started. I wouldn't worry about publishing. Like just writing something that's good quality, someone will read it and find value and you'll get it out there. And today there's self-publishing, there's the internet. Like you can do lots of stuff on your own. It's not just in the publisher's ball court anymore, so. I was, Always, uh, just I'll uh, do a brief intro. <laughs> you know, I was always a writer. Um, uh, as an advertising person, I'm a writer. I'm a copywriter. Uh, but I began as a poet, and I still write poetry. And all I do pretty much, my focus in terms of my, my own writing is poetry. I, I do write short stories. Uh, and I am working on several several different things. Uh, my mind tends to be a bit of a wanderer. Uh, but when Kum said today it was going to be a, on the theme of uh, neighborhoods, uh, I was trying to figure out what I would read uh, uh, as, as my set of poems. So this is a very unusual neighborhood uh, that I'm going to read about, Toronto neighborhood, because it's in the air. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I. I was I, I was on the on the TTC in the subway, and uh, the train came out at Broadview as it crossed over the Don Valley, uh, and you know, there was this burst. I was traveling. I, don't know, I can't remember why I was traveling uh, into the downtown area, uh, and there was this burst of sunlight, and you know the the valley below and the river and uh, the, the the Bayview extension and all of that below me, and then whoosh, you were back into the dark. And I thought, oh, that was interesting. Uh, and so I decided I was going to, every time I ever wrote the TDC and did that particular stretch, I was going to write a poem for that time. Exactly that time. I, I had to write it in my head, of course, because I wasn't always carrying paper. Or anything. So I, I began writing a series of poems, which are, I, which are called Poems Upon a Viaduct. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm going to read you a few of those poems, and it's an ongoing series, of course, and maybe never end until I do. Um, uh, That's good, you never leave. <laughs> <laughs> if, they, if they'll ever have me. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, one, a black opening, an opening, a line of trees, a flash of road, a stream, a bridge, a boat, a path, a road, a flash, a line of reeds, a black ending. Tunnel visions lead narrow insights to the edge. They jump, ants like cars far below. The car above, the cars below, shakes and shrugs from the shoulder, slides down at the lip of the bridge, holds our gaze, unmovingly moving things fix us. The grid passes, 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 iron-faced, steel-laced, the grid's lace through which sun appears as through a curtain of summer, the room's dark, the gridless tunnels full of trained shadows crisscrossing evening light into the wall. Green bobs and weaves, water, leaves, 
the sky a bowl for salad, a summer of straws slurping up a river, asphalt, a barbecue burn striped on a forest, the smell of wet grass, moldy leaves, bark that seeps or rots, its sap a joy or a weep, the road is cutting and leaves beside itself with the naked metal of the rail, the sleeper for company as the train turns into the dark. Windows flash past, the face of a friend, earnest, mid-sentence. The sun is ending, its own. The round black period we are rushing into. And on the other side, night and liars. That was on my way to an award show. <laughs> in, ad <laughs> in advertising. <laughs> A beggar's harp, this veil of mercy, this sheet of string, the song of rattle, this hiss of steel, this feel of pleasure, this fall of death, this ride of leisure, this liquid wet, this river falling, this body still, this swinging train car, this veil of stings, this veil of sharp, this veil of stings. Brown and brown, black and black, culverts and the river lie stack on stack, the playing fields oval, the teardrops round that fall and fall when we hit the ground. It's the viaduct, you know. <laughs> and this is the last one. The crotch of land, water curls across pylons play at Archangel, wiring home the good news, the great white on the train runs on, is on. On the train, people spark and electric thought. Yes, there definitely is a tension. Um, you know, uh, there is, I think, uh, as you can tell, if you look at me, I'm not fond of the idea of the starving poet. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, I, and I, 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 I'm the son of a professor of literature, and, you know, my mother knew that I loved uh, the, the good life, even as a child, and she kept saying, you know, you have champagne, uh, what did she say? She, you, have, you have champagne dreams, my son. <laughs> You'd better get a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how I sort of ended up in advertising. The other thing that happened was that I, uh, I also got my first check ever for writing poetry around the same time I, I began my career in advertising uh, 30 years ago in, in India. And it was so magnificent and so small the check that I never cashed it, <laughs> uh, but it was it was a fantastic <laughs> moment in my life because it it proved to me and it was actually uh, you know for a brief while the the newspaper the Independent uh, actually you know launched in India and the the the, the poetry editor uh, chose one of my poems to be published in it so it was it was phenomenal for me but it was also nothing in terms of money and you know and I. I needed to get married to that woman over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I needed to move very fast. And my priority was, you know, setting myself up and, uh, and I didn't even intend to be in advertising. I, I wrote a short story for a short story competition that was a talent search for copywriters and that's how I got hired as a copywriter. And so I even ended up in advertising inadvertently. Mm -hmm. uh, but I stayed in it quite consciously because it, uh, yeah, because it brought me comfort. It allowed me to, you know, and I think all writers who have struggled with the absence of comfort can understand the, the dilemma, uh, and I admire those who chose the other way uh, far more than I admire my own choice. But uh, I do not admire my own choice. Uh, but that's why I'm doing this today, <laughs> this sort of thing at least. So, 
uh, or feel able to. Trying to make amends, trying to… <laughs> trying to force people to listen to my poetry at the end of every evening. Uh, I'm completely unmusical, I, <laughs> so… Uh, but I am playful in the poetry I choose to read. Uh, advertising has necessarily to be entertaining for it to be received uh, and accepted by anyone whose life it intrudes into, so that is that job. But in terms of, in terms of writing, I, I, I always feel that you know, I owe it to the people I'm reading for to, to be light. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I, yes, uh, uh, something that they can, they can accept and, and receive and enjoy in the evening. A lot of my writing is in that way. Um, the ma vast majority of my poetry actually is a totally different form. Far and, and you know, the stuff that has been published is, you know, not, I wouldn't say dark, but uh, it's quite varied. It's, 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 it, it, it ranges over tremendous, tremendously different kinds of territory. Number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV.